Welcome to Is Scientific Slash Technological Progress Accelerating or Stagnating? We're going to introduce ourselves first. I'm Leslie Smith. I'm a physicist at CU Boulder and also a science fiction author. Uh, provocative topic. We'll see what y'all think. I'm Rebecca Lickis. I am also a physicist. I teach up at the Air Force Academy um, down in Colorado Springs. Um, I also write uh, science fiction, fantasy, uh, mystery, whatever just you know, occurs to me at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Aaron Springs. Uh, I guess I'm coming from more of a biological standpoint. Um, I, I've got, I do have degrees in, in um, general science and hazardous waste management, but then I, I focus more on entomology and arachnology and worked at the Denver Museum for several years. Cool. So let's jump right in. What does the panel think? Is tech scientific slash technological progress accelerating or stagnating? Thoughts? Oh. Oh, first answer? I would definitely say accelerating. Uh, I don't think there's any, any doubt about, about that. Um, in fact, um, Buck Mr. Fuller had a really nice graph showing uh, uh, technological advancements and, and you know, almost exponential rate of increase. And I, I think that's still true today. So we've got another member. Uh, we just did introductions. Please introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. I'm uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're the hot seat. I couldn't find this one earlier. Uh, Doug Mason. Um, my uh, background is a physicist, uh, both a plasma and space physicist, but also I've written about uh, 15 books. Uh, some of them with uh, Kevin Anderson. And just finishing up a collaboration this week with uh, Ben Bowler. Oh, wow. Awesome. So we had one opinion that yes, progress is accelerating. How about our newcomer? What do you think? And the question was... <laughs> is science and technology uh, progress accelerating or stagnating? Well, the, the progress <coughs> itself. I think, I think the, uh, the progress itself is uh, accelerating at an incredible rate. And uh, now the... And, and I, I think in two hours uh, there's another panel of the marching morons and how uh, society is, is growing and stuff. Now that's, I think that's an inverse relationship. <laughs> I agree. But, uh, but if you look, uh, and, and not just recently, but if you look at history um, of uh, scientific progress, and you look at something called the, uh, the idea or the creation versus time to market, uh, that time is, is shrinking uh, really rapidly. And you go back and look at something like uh, the zipper, the invention of the zipper, which from some time uh, when somebody came up with that idea to the time that it was actually used it was over 20 years. And as, as, as you get further, as we get closer and closer to the present, that time between when people come up with an idea to the time it gets to market and there's a use for it is accelerating. And part of that is due to the, uh, the so-called ESC. And I, 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 uh, I did a book on this called uh, Science and Technology, uh, on Science and Technology Policy, uh, after I worked at the, the White House Science Office. And, uh, and this, this S curve about um, basically where time is on this axis and the number of applications on this axis, this S curve is when you have the invention and the number of applications is very, very little, and then it steepens. And that's when the applications that people start to use the, the, cre the creation for is nothing near what the creator had thought that it would be used for. And that's where you get that, expo uh, that uh, exponential growth. And then it kind of uh, uh, peters out, so-called S curve. And, and that is shrinking. That time is shrinking, too. So uh, at least from, from what I've seen, but I'm open to arguments, of course, uh, yes, scientific progress is, uh, is increasing. Cool. Mm -hmm. So far, two optimists. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't think it's stagnating, but scientific progress in some ways reminds me of growth in kids. 
you'll get you'll get a spurt and then you know get a little bit over time and then we get another spurt and a little bit over time and then another spurt and yes in general I mean since since caveman days science and technology has been progressing and progressing and progressing and progressing and I think we're still progressing but I don't know if it's you know it's not it's not an even steady sort of thing it's kind of a not a lot of time. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So another positive, yay. Uh, I'm actually curious about the audience. Is scientific slash technological progress accelerating? Who agrees? I'm just kind of curious. Would you say that we're advancing because of our information age? Because when the advances come out and they're publicized, the public learns about them a lot sooner than they used to like when the zipper started? And maybe that's what's helping advance and get some support for science a lot more than what it was, say, 20 or even 30 years ago, just yeah. because the public knows about it. That's a great observation. That it may not be the only only reason, but I think it's that interconnectivity and uh, people being able to get the either the word out or the uh, um, the, the, the usage out of it. Probably, probably helps, but it's not just in in one area either, where you just might have engineering or physics. But you have so many uh, areas now that this is happening in. And then also, it, maybe it's the same reason: is that it's it, it, it's it's just not in, in a, a single focus, but it's more of an interdisciplinary um, uh, way that people will use, hey, you know, I'll use this, this advancement from computational science, this one in physics, this one in biology, and you're putting it together to create this. So, anybody in the audience think it's stagnating? I think people are going to get bored with a lot of it. We're going to start to a point where we have these, these extreme parts where we've got, oh, this is a brand new thing, those, those peaks, right? But we're, we're going to hit now is eventually you're going to hit like a plateau where people are like, well, in what way does this benefit me more than the previous thing? To a point where the where there won't be a lot of, um, there will be a plateaued public interest which may cause funding and other such things to go down. Similar to what we see with, say, NASA where, hey, we hit the moon. Well, now what? Well, we're going to go hit Mars. It's going to take a little while. Yeah, we're bored of this already. That type of that we're going to run into that problem, and then in that case, we're kind of in a slowing. It may seem fast and accelerating, but we're technically about to hit a point where it will just kind of slow and stagnate. But it's going to be indetectable at this point. It's going to look like it's growing, but in actuality, instead of going up the mountain, we're on a plateau. We have a strong opinion in the back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree with. I don't remember if it's Mr. Beasley or Dr. Beasley. Doug. No. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I agree with Doug that many, uh, many technological innovations uh, are coming to market faster and faster, but I think that has more to do with capital markets and capital structure than it does with actual technology. To me, much of the technology that I see is refinements of what's already existed. Um, when I think of fundamental progress in science, I think uh, nuclear technology. When I think fundamental, uh, well, nuclear studies would probably be a better term. Fundamental advances in technology are like fixed wing powered flight. And so I don't think those fundamental advances have really happened since the early 20th century. So just want to put that opinion out there. So. Controversy. <laughs> uh, can, I, can I say something that, uh, if you look, if you look at the, uh, uh, the publications that are put out by the uh, uh, at least the, uh, the worldwide uh, scientific ex establishments that are uh, usually peer reviewed, mm -hmm. that they are they are monetizing increasingly each what? year, and and there is a a fundamental um, amount of uh, increase in knowledge that can be assigned to each of those papers. And it's just not, well, we're, we're going to publish just, just to publish, because the reviewers usually demand that something fundamental uh, is 
is um, contributed in that paper. Now, I'm not talking about all, all uh, peer reviewed papers, but <clears throat> for example, in physical review letters, which is kind of the, uh, the holy grail <coughs> where physicists want to publish, uh, if it's not a significant fundamental advance, then you won't get published because it's really a cutthroat uh, type area. And so, now, does, does each of those advances, do they equate to uh, the Wright brothers or you know, Goddard or, or something like that? Well, maybe or, or maybe not, but we're, we, 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 just don't, we just don't know. Um, I was reading something just last night in uh, Physics Today about how uh, the, the Chinese have made a breakthrough in acoustic transparency. This is the so-called uh, Harry Potter you know, <coughs> effect, where uh, they have created uh, three-dimensional macroscopic devices that make, um, that within these areas, sound cannot penetrate, even though there are you know, spaces that are, that are this big. And what they're trying to do then is to extend that to smaller and smaller wavelengths so that you can do this for you know, infrared, for light, for UV radiation. And it's just, it's just incredible these things that even the Chinese are, are coming up with that are fundamentally advanced in the field. So part of it is a nomenclature. What do you mean by fundamental advancement? What do you mean uh, by earth-shaking? We may not be in the position right now to determine what exactly those advances are. It may be somebody, you know, 20, 30 years from now. So I didn't give my opinion yet. And uh, I actually think the question is tricky. I think we need to separate out science progress from techno technological progress. Those are actually two different things, and it's driven by money. And why is accelerating or stagnating the only choices? <laughs> there could be a false dichotomy in the question, yeah. <laughs> so, unfortunately, my impression is, in terms of science, that the funding is not as robust for pure research as it has been in the past. So, nowadays, it seems like it's much more emphasizing uh, research to applications. Um, maybe you guys disagree. Um, I would say the technology issue also is complicated by the uh, planned obsolescence uh, idea, which we're very much in the middle of. So I would say that um, we still are making scientific and technological progress. Um, I don't know if I would say it was accelerating or stagnating, however. Panel, do you agree or disagree? Uh, uh, I think, no, you go ahead. I think it would, I would agree with a lot of what you said with um, uh, with funding. Um, I know in the last five, maybe ten years, a lot of the grants that we were getting at the museum, uh, you had to have an aspect worked in to the grant proposal for um, outreach and, um, you know, for public uh, information dissemination or, or um, uh, Kind of a little more touchy feely, and so it's it's when, when in the life sciences we don't get the same kind of grants that, that maybe a physicist would get. But um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, so so it definitely eats away at the pie, you know, um, for for your time and efforts and, and resources, uh, and so it's harder to do a, a pure research. Yeah. I, I think you're you're very right about the finances, and I think that was the real problem with the space program, is that you know at the time we're we're going to do this because you know we're we're the greatest and we're going to prove it we're going to prove it by getting to the moon, and we did that, and then at that point the people that had been pushing for that were no longer there, and the government looked at the money and said we can use our money better elsewhere. Um, one of the reasons we're not seeing the the same basic level technological breakthroughs is there's very little money for it. If, if, you know, 
If you want to do research in that, that's fine, but you're going to have to come up with the money yourself yeah. and the equipment and everything else because they want, they want results and they want something they can market. If your research is not going to lead to something they can market, nobody wants to pay for it. I agree. Well, except just to be a contrarian. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but if you look at the budgets, the research budgets, they're, they're steadily increasing. Um, what is also steadily increasing is the uh, number of rules and regulations the researchers have to follow and the number of reports that they have to hand in that you know, aren't related to uh, final, the final product. So is there a you know, positive effect in that? And then going back to the, uh, the space program, uh, you know, I... You know, it's right at seventeen billion dollars a year, and it's been you know increasing at three percent per year. So you know what I've seen is a shift from the manned space, the human space program, more to the science-based uh, uh, programs, and that's because you know they've uh, they've shut down the shuttle program. But on the other hand, I think the commercial industry is stepping up. You know, with SpaceX. Blue Origin to uh, uh, Virgin Galactic, mm -hmm. and I, I think it's going to be better for us. And, and the reason for that is I, I'm a true believer in the marketplace, you know, the Darwinism of, uh, of ideas. And if government programs can't survive when they compete against uh, uh, other more efficient commercial ways of doing the same thing, and this is the technology part of it, then the government probably ought to uh, get out of it because, you know, we're very good, we, the government, are very good at making the initial investment, you know, going where nobody's gone before and having the risk, but as soon as that stuff starts to get institutionalized, I believe government needs to pull out you get more me efficient mechanisms. And, you know, we've seen it with commercial airlines. You know, airmail government did that at first, and they pulled out. And you know, now we have a commercial airline industry. You probably see it in the space program. We saw it in uh, supercomputers, uh, where you know it used to be the national labs used to be the, the driver for uh, technology, and now it's you know, the cell phones. And well, you're sort of proving my point, though. Uh, if there's research, this pure research is not commercially, you don't make money on it. Mm. So like a perfect example is in the U.S. is when Congress canceled the superconducting superglider in the 90s. So that was pure research. It was expensive, but there was no immediate uh, technological, well, I guess there was, they learned some technological things by creating it, but there was no product that you're going to bring to marketplace. So uh, I, I was part of killing that deal too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason is that the uh, Europeans were building the collider, and uh, for much less cost, and it was lower, uh, uh, lower energy. But uh, most physicists agreed that you could do, you know, get the same type of advancements, and and they did. And so instead, that billions of dollars was put elsewhere. So now Europe is the leader in high energy physics. Who knows what? Well, what discoveries will come out of that? Well, we're the leader in software and you know cell phones. And, okay, it's Darwinism. It's uh, scientific Darwinism. A lot of interest in the audience. How about in the front row? I just totally support that that side because uh, I joined AT and T right after the divestiture and Bell Labs. Up until then was being, you know, with ATT being a monopoly, Bell Labs was doing a lot of pure research, even as a quasi-independent uh, company. But as soon as it became um, no longer having the monopoly, uh, Bell Labs was a drag on all the other uh, operating units, and uh, <laughs> it's just such a shadow of, of its former self, and that's known by owned by Nokia now. <laughs> In the second row, you've had your hand up a while. Yeah, how many things have been uh, how much research has been stopped by the national corporations because it wasn't 
uh, a money-making thing. I know you get a lot of grants and other things from uh, different rich corporations, but how many things have been stopped because they didn't think it was worth the effort? That's a great question, but hard to answer, right? <laughs> yeah. Where are they going to get the money if these corporations don't think it's any good? It's very hard to get the public to be interested. And the corporations seem to be owning more and more new patents so nobody can get something out there without them saying so. That's where I think the government should play a part in peer research, which it seems like it's going away. But, but, but there's, no, there's no data for that because the National Science Foundation, their, their, uh, their budget is increasing every year. And, and, and these are two different, you know, two different aspects of research that you're talking about. One, uh, commercial, and, and, and companies have a, you know, to be contrarian again, they, they have a responsibility to the shareholders of getting something out that makes money. And yeah, I, you know, I cried when Bell went away too. Mm -hmm. But but you have look at Google, you know, look at Apple. And 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 and, and, and it's shifting where the the research is, is being done in, in corporations. The government still has that, that vast fundamental uh, uh, research investment that it's still making with not only the National Science Foundation, the National Laboratories. When I was at Los Alamos, we had a $2.4 billion budget, and we put over $100 million a year just in pure research, and they're still doing that. It sounds like a lot of money when you, you know, just throw out, but when you look at the size of the budget, it's a drop in the bucket. I mean, it, it, it's... But, it, but yet, it's the 2.5% of that, that budget. And that's why I say you got to go back to the data if you're making, because I, I, I understand as a scientist, it's frustrating. I've had projects killed too. But, you know, again, it's, it, you, when, you're, when you're funding somebody forever to do the same type of work and they're not making any progress, sometimes that's bad, sometimes that's good. And, and the, 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 what I think what we've seen is, you know, we're still the technology leaders in, in the world. And this process, as contorted as it is, uh, is I think still doing a good job. In the back, you've been patient. Um, I think one of the problems I, I, that I personally see, it looks like to me technology is really stagnating because it is, uh, it's a lack of education in the progress of the technology. Because one of the reasons why the public sector doesn't push to get some of the, the advances done that can be done that are possible is they don't know about them. And you know, I, I think one of the one of the biggest issues is the fact that there when you do get into some of some of the technical when you get into the real you know, the technical side of it, you know the as a public don't understand a lot of the technical jargon and nobody's want nobody wants to put the effort forth to truly teach somebody what can be because they're you know the corporations are only out to make money so if they're not making money off it they don't care well public opinion sways in a direction differently I mean the space program would be a perfect example of that if public if the public was a, you know was better educated on the what we're learning of about Mars the technology technological advances we've made to make that journey I think it would make people more you know involved in it and get people more excited about the possibilities of what we can do. Yay, education. <laughs> I agree, education is good. Probably the rest of the panel does as well. Yeah. Um, you know, really, do you really think that would be so? Because a great deal of, of pure research is indeed pure research and eventually it will be um, it will be useful or it will be informative in the grand uh, structure of things. But in the meantime, you say, how many, how many millions are we going to spend to crunch a particle? And at the end of the day, that's what it sounds like, figuring out what a new particle is. And then when you say, but well, what's the use? You say, well, that, that's when business takes it over. 
Now, the space program got a lot of money because there was a clear goal. Pure research so often does not have a clear goal, and in that case, you know, people are not going to be so inclined to say, spend my money on it. It's a fair point in the front. The point I was going to make has to do is you're talking about the National Science Organization, the budget keeps going up. At the same time, over the years, the way that the, the profits for corporations, if they're saying we're putting this amount of money into R&D, has been cut because the tax breaks that they get has been cut. So they're saying, why put money into it? So from the corporation's point of view, there's no money in it. Even though it's basic R&D, it may wind up being very beneficial to us or somebody else. We're not interested. So I'm not sure how that relates in terms of the money keep going into to research from the government's point of view equates. Yeah, your big corporate, your big labs are getting more money, but the amount of money that's been spread out over smaller labs that actually do a lot more innovation than the big labs do has been cut. Right. And so you need to go back and see what's the cause of that and where you elect counts. Because yeah. they change the tax code. And if we have the highest tax code right now in the industrial... Danger, danger. I don't think we want to get into politics. Let me say one thing, though, about the, uh, the space program, too, is that, you know, that, that budget has been fairly fairly constant. And, and you know, I mentioned earlier it's been switched from the manned to the, to the unmanned um, uh, human uh, 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 part, uh, the science part. And, and, and those are two radically different tribes that they have uh, in NASA. People who believe in, in human exploration and those who believe in just in, in science. And they're, they fight to the death. But what most people don't realize is that the real reason the, uh, the space program was established was not because, well, sure we have a clear goal, but it was national security back then. Clearly, one third NASA only was one third of the entire space space program. People say, well, yeah, I guess we had, you know, the, the nuclear ICBM part was the other third. But what was the final third? And that was the National Re Reconnaissance Office, the spy satellites. And that was only funded and only brought out in the open, uh, not the RO, but uh, the space program, because they could make advances in the, the so-called white world they feed that into the two-thirds of the, the other part of the space program. And we don't have that driver anymore. Not to say that we should have that driver, but that was the reason why 60s had so much money put into it. If I may make a point about that, specifically with NASA, the original contract for NASA was trying to develop things that the individual companies could not afford. So they started putting money into very large wind tunnels, etc. So they put large amounts of money into big wind tunnels like out of Ames. And then they mop them. What happened? Computational aerodynamics. Computer modeling. Um, <laughs> no, the point I'm trying to say is they put a lot of money into infrastructure and then mop them. Interesting point, you know. Um, I wanted to, to go back to another thing where okay. we were talking about education uh, part of this. And again, be careful, I don't want to get into political stuff. But uh, education itself can get very politicized. Mm -hmm. And what gets taught and what is required, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, you cannot force people to be scientists, which is what they appear to be trying to do now in the high schools, because they keep increasing, you have to, have to have more math, you have to have more science, you have to have more, and they seem to be trying to, to shove people into the science and engineering and math, which I know, they want them, I want more people in the science and engineering and math too, uh, technology, all that kind of stuff, but you can't force the kids to do it. You cannot force anybody to go that track. People go that track because they love the work. And trying to shove more kids into that is, is not going to work. And they are. I mean, the levels of education now are increasing. I mean, people like to talk, and I know it. Where the other professors were like, oh, these kids are my algebra. <laughs> when I was your age. You know? <laughs> but, you know, the kindergarten used to be, all you had to learn in kindergarten was learn to sit still when the teacher told you to sit still. 
learn your colors and maybe learn some or most of your, your letters. And you were good. They're teaching reading. Kindergarten kids are learning to read. They're learning math at earlier ages. They're trying to shove this all down. They're trying to get it so you get algebra either uh, elementary school or middle school so that by the time you get to high school they can get you you know through the others and into calculus before college and now you know you have to have a college degree to get jobs that used to be available just with a high school diploma and I still look at it and I go wait a minute you don't really need anything more than a high school diploma to be a receptionist but you have to have you have to have <coughs> just to get the interview. And that's ridiculous. There's a lot of jobs that can be done without. I don't know how we're going to change that. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, I have no answer for that. I mean, yes, if, if you're going to go on in engineering or science or <coughs> you want to be you know, work uh, somewhere where you're going to need an advanced degree, yes, go get the advanced degree. That's great. But it's not for everyone, and it shouldn't be for everyone. And there still should be good paying jobs, living wage paying jobs that you can get without a bachelor's degree. But um, yes. if, if I could jump on yeah. that, but, so between education and the comment on communication, I think it's really important because uh, uh, today people can't seem to differentiate between a, a primary source of information or a secondary tertiary or even a Facebook meme. It's all the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's, all, it's all the same to them. And that's what drives me crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> I actually uh, sort of disagree with you. Oh, well. So, uh, <laughs> I still like you. One of my uh, passions is letting everyone have an opportunity at a STEM career if they want. So, I've actually studied this whole issue quite a bit. And there's a lot of implicit bias in girls and people of color that starts when they're kids that uh, turns them away from uh, STEM careers. And it's not that they wouldn't be great at the job or that they wouldn't actually like it if they hadn't been subtly turned against it. So I think that's um, Obviously, you shouldn't force people to do something they don't want, but I would say let's be very careful and let kids do what they want and try not to force them into certain uh, narrow stereotypes like being a receptionist. And some of that bias is not uh, external, it's mm -hmm. internal. Oh, right. And yeah, the magic age for, uh, mm -hmm. for young women is 12 years old, uh, we found, and uh, when we're investing in science and technology programs for schools because that's the age where they discover boys and <laughs> and if they're all of a sudden smarter smarter than Joe then well I'm gonna act dumb uh, because he doesn't like girls that are smarter than him. I mean that that's very simplified but if you can get the young women to be motivated to get past that, that hump well, that well, does come into play, play, but I actually do meet, I meet uh, girls and women of all ages that when I travel around, and I constantly get the comment, oh, it's too hard for me. I mean, of all ages, even grown women, oh, I can't do math. Um, it's, that's not true. You can. Well, my, my answer to Could that. Could we get back on the subject? <laughs> Yes, this is the marching morons. <laughs> this is the wrong camera. Right. I, I would like to Go make ahead, a point and have been trying yes. to do so for the last 10 patient. minutes. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, right. please. Yeah. And the point is this. The increase of, uh, there is, there's a difference between progress and information. Uh, recently, recently, someone mentioned that medical, that medical technology is producing something, if I recall the number correctly, 6,000 papers per day. Nobody can keep up. And so we're reaching a point where there is a saturation level simply because the individual researcher can literally not keep up with the literature in many fields. There has to be some progress along those lines if we're to do anything at all. Uh, obviously, IBM is interested in this because of their huge computers and other people's huge computers.
But that is a limiting factor for most scientists is simply being able to keep up with the literature. You cannot spend all your time doing nothing but reading papers. There is also the problem of, of the minimum research in, in, increment that can be published, and I, anybody who's, who has published in physics in particular has, has run into this one where there are, five, there are 16 papers being published and basically there are small, small little pieces of each, uh, of each one uh, that, they, that give you, simply give you a publication so you have a longer list for, for, for promotion. But there is this fundamental limitation of how much information the individual researcher can absorb. And so back to the question, is this not a limiting factor for scientific progress? It's a good question. <laughs> Thank you. What does the panel think? I know there's a lot of researchers out there that say, we don't know what we know. And out of, those, out of all those papers, it's not 6,000 papers on 6,000 individual topics. But there's researchers doing, <clears throat> don't know anything about each other, doing research on the exact same topic with the exact same goal, getting the you know, same or similar results. Both of them publish in two different papers, and they never know about each other. Well, that's, that's not good. Yeah. There's yeah, a that, thing called the web of science. That has been the case now the for a couple, a couple of decades. I personally had it happen when I was doing a thesis project, and I knew about two other projects in this country that were doing it, but there was somebody in Russia who was doing the same project, and he published about three months before I was ready to get, to get ready to go. So I lost. And so you see this problem has been around for a long time. Uh, we have better communications now, but it's still not enough to process and to filter to get to find where the where the information is actually coming from and who's actually done what. Well, coming from uh, the, like the arachnology is a pretty small field, and we know each other pretty well. Um, so I don't know, I don't know if maybe uh, more intercommunication and just building personal connections with other researchers would help that or not. Uh, and, and I mean, you know, in, certain, in, in labs, and you know, like in a certain lab, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of do similar research, you know, year after year. And, and so you can say, oh yeah, well, you know, like they always work on, um, you know, wolf spiders. And so you can, you know, if, so if you're interested in a wolf spider project, you can see what they're working on so that you're not duplicating because they're going to they're be doing 90% of the work. This is called so. silo, siloization. It's called it's narrowing, 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 right. narrowing. And this is, has also, is also a major problem and a major limiting factor. True. That's actually the point I was going to make. Everybody <coughs> seems like they're specializing more right. and more and more now, uh, so you can keep up with all the info. But a great resource is the Web of Science. So they even have this thing called the Science Citation Index, where you'd have to go to the library and there's these big paper journals and you'd have to look through the index and try and find all the different topic here and then the paper over here and then it was like a whole huge rigmarole. Really? It still exists. <laughs> but the Web of Science has it all. You can just look up under topic or author or it's awesome. Uh, in the back, I think. So what it seems like a lot of this stuff comes down to for me with the education, with the funding, uh, with the quantity of papers, with, as the gentleman back here was saying, the siloization, to me it looks like it comes down to quantity versus quality. Yes, there's a lot more quantity in a lot of fields, um, but there's less quality. And I think advancement is a qualitative statement. So, um, you know, I wanted, to, I wanted to put that out there. And, and as an example of, you know, education that's not happening. I, one of the things that gets me is the idea of molten salt reactors. It's a, it's a form of reactor technology where, now I am not an, I am not a nuclear scientist, I want to put this out there. I'm an, autodidact, I'm an autodidact and so fundamentally a lay person. But the understanding that I have been given is that a, molten, a molten salt reactor, because it is permanently in a molten state, basically does not melt down. If the reactor breaks, the core cools, and it's safe. And the reason why more uh, funding wasn't put towards molten salt reactors and more development didn't happen there 
was because originally here in the United States and a lot of other countries that developed new nuclear technology, pressure water reactors uh, were better for military applications. And so that got the funding. And so that's, you know, that's some information that you know, probably could use a little bit more study, but isn't widely enough known for people to have a real dialogue about. It. Uh, so quality versus quantity. I would disagree with that because with peer review, hopefully you're, you're, um, you're, you're able to, to uh, eliminate poor quality or, or it would be published in a less prestigious you know, publication. Uh, so, 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 so Doug mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm sorry to speak without raising my hand, but Doug mentioned earlier physical review letters. Four years ago, I was having a discussion with a friend of mine who was a physics student. And I was, I was expressing some questions about string theory. And he was, he was a big proponent. So he's like, well, Jim, you know, what you're saying about string theory hasn't uh, actually discovered any particles or made any theoretical predictions that have actually come true. Read through the last year of physical review letters, uh, and you will find the answers to your questions. So I went to the library, and I got the last 13 months of physical review letters at that time. And I went through every publication. And I found eight articles that talked about string theory, and all of them vindicated what I had been saying. <laughs> uh, so you know, so, so once I'm not sure that the peer review process always, maybe it did work. I don't think it's working now. Well, that's that's also very anecdotal too. I mean, I think I think statistically, uh, I would say that peer review is probably still working, but but I'm, it's not a perfect system. So this is all related to a topic we're also supposed to discuss, which is how does word of scientific discoveries get from the lab to the public? Thoughts, Andy? Well, the, the, uh, I was going to mention this with, with one of the points that you had brought up that, that I agree with, and, and that it's, it's the way that, that uh, uh, research is conducted itself is evolving, you know, away from the single, you know, brilliant scientist or whatever that would make the fundamental discovery and make the announcement and mm -hmm. you know that, that's it. But it but it, um, it it's it's more of, of collaboration. It's more of um, uh, interdisciplinary uh, advances and it's 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 a a layer of, of different types of, of people that can can have that creativity to recognize that application of whatever the uh, uh, the advancement is, and so it's just not one. What I'm saying is just not one path, but it's a it's it's a it's a lot of paths where you can get that information out to the public. And then going back to a comment I made earlier is is very very ra rarely are these advances. Um, used in the way that they were originally conceived to be used. And, you know, the, the people who are good at, at uh, explaining to the public, you know, like a Steve Jobs was, you know, was, was nowhere near good at doing research. Some of the people who do research are nowhere near good at, at uh, getting that information out. And, it's, it, and so what I'm saying is that this whole process of scientific and technological advancement that's what is more of a it's evolving with more of a huge collaboration, collaborative effort. At least the way that I the way I feel. Mm -hmm. So we had an interesting comment earlier about uh, the public gets its info different ways, Facebook and what have you. Is that good or bad? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Facebook? No. <laughs> One of the professors has this comic up on his door, and it, it shows this news cycle for scientific discoveries and starts with the scientist makes the discovery, publishes the paper, and then the, the science news uh, website condenses it down. And then the regular news sites get a hold of it, but they've got to make it into a sound bite. And so then the announcement is that you know something totally different from what was actually found comes out, 
and then the scientist gets a call from her mother. And I, but yeah, that's that's pretty much how it works. By the time a lot of it, not not all of it, but a lot of it, by the time it gets out to the public, it's so warped from what was actually there. Whenever I see a science news, you know, little little news snippet, I start tracing it back. Okay, which which journal did it come from? Okay, I can get that journal, pull this journal out, look at the actual thing to see. What did they really yeah. find? As long as you have the proper filter. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then, then all those sources are good. There, there was a, just, just an example. They, they just made a, a discovery um, in, um, in, in biology that had its roots in, a, in, a, in an H.P. Lovecraft collection of, of poems. And, <laughs> and, 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 and I saw this. It was in the Wall Street Journal. And, and it said, these researchers had run across the phrase blood curdling uh, collection of poems. And these were these were biologists that blood, I wonder if fear can really curdle the blood. <laughs> and they did some research and there was a protein, factor eight or something like that, which causes the blood actually to congeal and become blood curdling. And so they ran these tests, what, having people watch two different types of movies. One was uh, the worst horror movies that they could, the scariest horror movies that they could put together. And the other were the most boring things like, you know, um, Day in the French Countryside or something like that. That, that didn't have, you know, any, any danger at all. And what they found was that there was a 17%, it was like a two and a half uh, sigma. 17% increase in the amount of this blood curdling protein. <laughs> and that scientific discovery came about because a researcher was reading something. Mm -hmm. that's right. and, and so and that's what I mean. It's a, it's a give and take, and it's. And, and, and just in line with the scientific and technological. So I think we're pretty much out of time. Final comments from the panel. Talk to you. Um, <laughs> no, what do you do? <laughs> Uh, well, so I guess I'm I'm uh, a romantic. So um, I mean, I know there's there's flaws in a lot of our system. Um, the, the free market doesn't always work. There's bias built in. Uh, but I think it, in general, um, I think uh, technology's advancing. Uh, yeah. People have been complaining since the uh, invention of the wheel that you know it's not it's not going your way. It's not going fast enough. <laughs> But yeah, we are progressing. <clears throat> so my final thought is thank you for coming. Sorry we didn't get to everybody's comments, but there was it was nice. There was a lot of interest. Yeah, and really really sharp people out there that should have, could have been up here. <laughs> so thank you guys. <laughs>